Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the beginning of this week's study. Now, it is possible that today we may complete part 12 of these presentations. Now, we have a lot to address, a lot to consider. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might more rightly understand that which is being written and which we will need to be able to present to those with whom we come in contact. Shall we now ask for this guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you have presented for us to come to know you better, to open your word, to consider carefully that which is presented before us. We ask now, Father, for your guidance. We ask for your wisdom and we ask for your blessing. We do not look to accuse. We do not look to criticize. We look to come together in unity, to be directed where you would have us to walk. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Direct us now in all things. Help us so that what that is being done may be according to your will. I thank you for each that are at this meeting today. We each come before you. We ask, Father, that your spirit may open our minds and guide us, for we definitely need the comforter. We ask that your angels attend us. Show us where we should walk. Help me today, Father, so that the words that are spoken may be those that you would have spoken at this time. We praise you for all that you're doing in our lives. Be with us now. For this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a very brief recap at this point. When we were finishing this last week, this portion from Desire of Ages 221 was being presented with some asides. Herodias knew that by direct measure, she could never win Herod's consent to the death of John, and she resolved to accomplish her purpose by stratagem. As we look at this, stratagem is a noun that originally comes from the Latin and from the Greek, but it was the second definition that fits better than the first. Yeah, so he just shows the first definition that has to do with war. Right. So in this, he continues, here is where Salome comes into play. Herodias cannot directly cause Herod to execute John the Baptist. And now Salome is implied, employed to provide the needed assist. So yeah, so, so, just the, so when we're looking at, at, at his presentation, mm-hmm. he has a lot of these loose ends, right? These sort of, like, he presents a definition. He doesn't follow up on it. He doesn't say anything about it after he gives it. He doesn't say why he uses it, that definition, which seems to be pointing us down a wrong road, right, as far as I can see. The use of rabbit trails in this has become very prevalent. Yeah. So, I mean, how do we account for this? I mean, you know him. Yes, and do you have any accounting of why this paper is put together in this way? Because is it part of your normal experience with him? No. Or is it no? So have you read stuff that he's written in the past? I have attended times where he's given a presentation. These are the first written presentations of his that I have examined. I've had conversations with him in the past. There have been substantial times when I have spoken with him regarding things that I was seeing, and he would come back and be entirely dismissive of what I was saying. That's Glenn's nature, I have found, was dismissive and, yeah. Argumentative, etc. Difficult, difficult man. It's it, it's frustrating for me for someone that I have known over fifty years. Yeah, you know, well, because I try to understand other people. I try to understand. You know, there is all of us have limitations, right? There's limitations, intellectual limitations, emotional limitations, things about our personality that make it difficult for us to communicate with others. 
so some people just have have problems thinking clearly, right? They're not able to sort through information or to follow through the logical step step by step presentation. Right. If you're saying when he presents publicly, like in a sermon or something, it's going to be logical, or does it have this nature to it? It does have this nature to it. He speaks. I mean, when when he's presenting a type of a sermon, he tends to as as he says, not want to follow the rabbit trails, but yet in his written right in in his written presentations, he has many loose ends, many rabbit trails, many things where he's pointing dir- different directions. Yeah, and and so for us, you know, who we have to evaluate our own way of thinking. How do we think things through? Do right. we we deal with these? loose ends in our own thinking. I, I guess for me, you know, just my nature, I, I tend to be, we'll just use the word obsessive when it comes to dealing with unresolved details, it, it, you know, to sort of put it in the pop culture context, uh, Columbo. <laughs> okay. You know, like there's just little things that don't seem to make sense. Um, and so he has to resolve those little points. You know, I have this question, you know, like, what about this one little detail here? And now he says in, in the beginning of his study, Glenn does, that, you know, we're not going to deal with the minutia. And so we have to think, we have to consider, like, how important are details? Um, you know, there's the saying that the devil, are, the devil is in the details. Uh, details are important. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not naturally a person who who likes dealing with details except because of my other part of my character right so i'm i'm a guy who sees the forest uh first i'm a i, I, I connect things I, I you know tend to be broad in my thinking but I, I recognize how important details are and doing a job obviously details are important and uh you know so i've learned through the years to pay attention to details when i'm, I'm building something you know those, those it can save you a lot of time, but but in our intellectual environment, so we have our our spiritual and intellectual, which we studied about yesterday. You know, we have the intellectual part of us, and we have the spiritual part of us. Now, the intellectual is just understanding ideas. Uh, the spiritual, we would say, is the more practical aspect of how do we apply it? Do we obey God's word or not? Now, I do think that. Part of the problem is that uh, if a person is impractical, that is, if they just live in their head, they can think things make sense until you have to do them, right? So you can have a theory about something, but when you actually do something practical, you can see what works and what doesn't. Is Glenn practical at all? No. I know that's a hard thing to always say about Okay, let me, we'll, we'll step back for a moment. When, when Glenn had completed high school, he wanted to be very much in the same industry that his father had been. Now, his father had been a, what they call a tool pusher for a fairly large oil company. Okay. Glenn followed in his father's footsteps in that he became a water well driller in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. It's surprising to me because as a driller, there's a whole bunch of little details that you have to pay attention to in order to properly bring in a well. Mm -hmm. So for him to set aside details in a Bible study has been a red flag to me. Yeah, so it doesn't correlate with what he would have to do in his work. And that's what I was kind of wondering. Now, um, I, I recall one particular time where he was, he was drilling a well. He was 19 years old. He was having to develop this well, and his name went on the records in the state. Not only was he the youngest driller ever licensed in the state, mm-hmm. But he proved that a, a very major company had been dumping, um, for lack of a better word, slag on a person, on a 
party's piece of property and this slag led to the animals that were on this property becoming very ill. And so this company had to pay a major amount of money for environmental cleanup. Mm -hmm. Had Glenn not followed through and noted meticulously what he was finding in his log, paying attention to the little details, this would not have occurred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's just kind of a disconnect here. So, you know, I would think generally one of the things is I learned from practical life, um, actually how to study, like how to be more thorough when it, when it comes to studying. Um, so, uh, yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't make much sense to me. So maybe here there's just, you know, because we're not trying to here to judge Glenn and, and decide, but just like to learn from this. So, you know, maybe there's something where uh, he's not wanting to yield to something so that there's some more spiritual issue involved. There and, could... and, and, and we would have to think that about ourselves. Like, you know, we need to be examine, examine our own experience and say, you know, why am I having this discussion with someone? Why am I? Uh, am, am I defensive? Right. Um, you know, people, when they, uh, you know, when somebody's honest, they're not going to have trouble giving a, an account of a narrative or something that has happened. Right. Right. But when someone's dishonest, um, they're not going to, it's not going to be possible to keep track of, of where, their story, the story is going to sound inconsistent, right? Right. The narrative will be inconsistent. And, you know, maybe there's just something here that's just of what he's dealing with personally you know, on, on a spiritual level that this shows up, that he's not that he's intentionally trying to mislead, but he has an intent of what he wants to prove. And even if things don't lead down that path, he keeps pushing through the brush, so to speak, to get to where he wants to go. And it and ignores details to do so. Right. I don't know. It, but it, it but it is something that, you know, I'm, I'm really puzzle over, right? I'm puzzling over how someone could put together a paper like this or a series of papers that that are what I would call sloppy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I teach guitar, um, one of the things I tell my students about interpreting a piece of music is that whatever it is, however you're going to interpret a piece of music, you need to be very clear on what it is you're saying. You, ha you have to be consistent. You can't have an interpretation that varies through a piece. Uh, you have to decide how you're going to accent the rhythms and you're going to have to think about your phrasing and you think usually create some kind of, you know, emotional idea or story behind the piece that, that, that you're interpreting, that even if there's different sections, um, that it's telling a story, right? And that you have to be aware of that and you have to listen to yourself and you have to recognize that you have to develop certain techniques to get what you want and so forth. But here, it's not clear what the story is that he's been trying to tell. Right. And that he's, he's sort of catering to different audiences in his mind of, well, I need to say this because people are going to think this about what I'm saying if I don't tell them that. And I better mention this because somebody else, uh, I mean, that's the only way that I can and figure out what's going on is that, He's, he's not sure himself. One is what his conclusion was going to be when he started, um, at least how he was going to get to his conclusion. I think he had his idea of what the king of the north and the king of the south was. And so he just seems to be forcing everything in to fit that way. Um, and the only reason why I could think he, he brings up this, this stratagem having to do with war, because in the back of his mind, he's, he's trying to apply this to the king of the north and the king of the south, right? But but he's not clearly telling us why he's doing this. And then, of course, we looked at this story, um, you know, dealing with Salome, Herodias, and Herod. And it's supposed to be about the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, but two of the powers are what we would call the false prophet mm -hmm. in his interpretation. So, 
it, it's really strange. But anyway, that's the point I wanted to address, that whole thing dealing with how we think about things and how we have to examine ourselves in this in this regard. Okay. And thank you. That's um, very astute. Herodias instructed Salome to dance before Herod, realizing that Herod, dazed with wine, would be more likely to grant her wish for the death of John. In the Bible, wine represents either true or false doctrine, and Herod being dazed rather than enlightened represents the USA coming under the influence of a false religion. Now, keep this point in mind as we finish through this article. Mm -hmm. Here, Glenn is saying that Herod is a representation of the USA coming under the influence of a false religion. Now, is that godly or is this of the adversary? Yeah. So is the USA a godly power or a satanic power in this context? Herod, Herod representing the government powers. This comes from Jeff's studies as well. Right. But I mean, again, the, the question, brother, is this. Is this representing a godly power or a satanic power? The latter. Okay. Salome was in her first flush of womanhood, and they were captivated by her voluptuous beauty. This represents the finished product of apostate Protestantism fully united with spiritualism. In other words, by uniting with spiritualism, apostate Protestantism has arrived at womanhood, no longer a child, but fully able to enchant and seduce. I don't know that I agree with him on this. Well, she's a young daughter of Babylon, represents also the daughters of Babylon. Right, but I mean, I, I believe from Spirit of Prophecy, it can be stated that she was a descendant of the priests and the ruling families of Israel. Captain Ward explains how this can be detail I wasn't learning. Well, if I if I did, I'll step back for just a second. Desire of Ages 221. Yeah. At these festivities, and a flattering compliment was paid to Herod when this daughter of Israel's priests and princes danced for the immune amusement of his guests. Yeah. So interesting. Agreed. As a result of her seductive dance, Herod offers to give her anything she wants up to half of his kingdom. This represents the U.S. government coming under the direct influence of apostate Protestantism, particularly that of spiritualism. Here he wishes us to refer to 5 Testimony 451, paragraph 1, for his proof. And that's grasping the hand of spiritualism. Right. right. <laughs> now, I'd interject the possibility that it's coming under the influence of the apostate or corrupt or whatever you want to say, Adventism, since it's from the daughter of, I don't know, maybe a stretch or a string, but could it well, be? Yeah. But what we had done in the past, is we had taken the story of Elijah and the priests of Baal and um, um, th that there was the, like the dance of deception. We paralleled these two different dances, right? The priests of Baal dancing around uh, the, the altar with, uh, you know, trying to get fire to come down, Baal to call fire down to consume their offering, right? So we've paralleled these two stories in the past. And uh, what were the, how did we, how did we address this symbol, symbolism of Herod Herodias and uh, Salome? And how did we compare that with Ahab, um, Elijah and the priests of Baal? So what was the parallel? Well, it wasn't like this. No, it wasn't like this. I mean, this just doesn't make any sense, especially in the context of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Right. So, so when we look at 5T, 5 Testimonies, 451, you know, that's the one where you're going to have, and I, I can't remember, there's one in the Great Controversy where she switches the order, but, you know, he reaches his hand across to grasp hands with spiritualism and also, that is, the United States, and to grasp hands with the Roman power. 
So in this thing called union, that's where they're going to unite under the Sunday law, right? So, so we have these three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Dragon power, that's the world, you know, the United Nations, the United States, that represents uh, the false prophet, and then the beast represents the papacy, the papal power. These are the three powers that are fighting for the control of the world. And we, we, we even see from a secular source dealing with Avril Manhattan, his book in the late 1950s, dealing with uh, uh, the Vatican, right? Um, let's see, the Vatican in world politics, that book, where, you know, he clearly shows that there are these, these powers fighting for the control of the world. And we saw that also in Louis F. Weir's books and his prediction about how the United States and the papacy would combine to overthrow the Soviet Union which at that time represents spiritualism, right? This atheistic power, which then moves to the UN in our history at the end of the world. So, so he doesn't seem to be clear on any of this. Right. Right. So just things that, that we would have understood as Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, he doesn't seem to be clear on it, but he's not addressing it. So if I was going to address if I had some different interpretation, I mean, one is I would clearly say, here is what we have been saying, and here is what I'm saying now, and here are the reasons. If if I believed that what we were saying before was incorrect or partially wrong or unclear in some way, right? But it doesn't seem like he even knows what we used to think. And and so somebody who's who is maybe half familiar with things. They're, they're, they're just going to follow what he's saying. They're not going to be able to sort through it because he's not making sense. <laughs> no. It's like the Haley, Hegelian dialectic sort of thing. You just, you just say a bunch of nonsense. You know, this is a simplification of it. Things that are contradictory and then you resolve them by just giving an answer and the person is just accepts the answer because when you finally make some sense, out of all this stuff they couldn't make sense of. But it, it's not logical. He's not helping us understand anything. And that is rather disturbing again. But um, so, so how, did we, how did we understand Herod, Herodias, and Salome as symbols of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Well, Herodias as the mother, as the one behind the scenes, didn't we place her more as the papacy? Yeah. Herod as the civil power. Right. Which would be like the UN. Right. right. And then Salome, the Protestants. Correct. Now, okay. when we when we read five testimony 451. Yeah. It's interesting to me how different the verbiage is here versus what what he's trying to force it to be mm -hmm. by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness mm -hmm. so the US disconnected from righteousness mm -hmm. when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism and when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that end is near. Now, in this, he's, he's trying to say that Herod, as a representative of the U.S. government, coming under the influence of Protestantism and particularly spiritualism, but he's, he's trying to say that Protestantism is being combined with spiritualism, that they're coming yeah. as 
as one unit. Right. Yeah. So he has Protestant slash spiritualism and he doesn't have spiritualism as 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 the world, as the UN, as the atheistic power. Correct. Um, and, and he's tried to make this argument, but not very well. Right. Through the earlier papers, it was pretty clear that what he was trying to prove he, he was not actually proving at all. He was actually disproving, but he just kept down that path. So to, but he doesn't have the three, pa- I mean, he's going to say, Herod is the United States, right? He's going to say, Salome is Protestants slash spiritualists. And then Herodias is um, uh, this uh, uh, papacy, right? But here in in this case, we can see that, I mean, is it, it it leaves out a lot of the world. Right, it does. Does it make it universal? It's the United States and uh, the Vatican, the papacy, the Catholic world. But it it leaves out the world as part of that threefold union. And, And this is an extreme divergence from Anything that we have ever understood uh, doesn't mean that what we understood before is correct, right? Because sometimes we need to be corrected. But here he hasn't given us a good reason uh, to reject what we already understood. I mean, it's it's uh, he hasn't he hasn't actually directly addressed any of what we understand about this. And, and he's presented something that seems inconsistent within itself. Now. Am I wrong when I read 5 Testimony 451, as I just did, in understanding that the threefold union is Protestantism, spiritualism, and Rome? That's what it is. She clearly says. Okay. Right? So he's going to have, he's going to put spiritualism as Protestantism. Right. 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 And then the United States as a separate power from Protestantism. But she's pretty clear. It's Protestant America, a Protestant and Republican government. That that that's the in, it just doesn't make any sense that he's going to separate these as two different powers within the division of Babylon. Would it be fair to address this? That Protestantism, spiritualism, and the Roman power are three that are joined to influence the one, which is America. No, because, well, Protestantism is part of America. All right. Right. So the way that, that we understand this, it is just Babylon, the city of Babylon, is divided into three parts. And we can see that those three parts are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So Babylon represents the entire world in its, and it has three different aspects to it, three different powers that are seeking for the control of the world. Right. Right. And, and that type comes from Rome. Remember, Rome is divided under Constantine into three sections. Right. Okay. Right, so you're going to have uh, because of his three sons. I uh, always forget their names. Uh, Constans, Constantine, and yeah. Const- a- Constantinus. I can't remember. Anyways, they're all they're all named after their dad. <laughs> and 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 of course, um, you know, they have the city of Constantinople, the city of Constantine, where uh, uh, Byz- uh, that's uh, Byzantinium is changed to. Uh, Const- Constantinople, now Istanbul. But anyway, so you have this this division of Rome into three parts, and that becomes a symbol for what happens later when Babylon is divided into three parts, right? Because Babylon represents Rome, right? So, so we have to remember all of these patterns have come to us from earlier scriptures and and prophecies and earlier histories. So, so it has to be the entire world that is divided into these three parts. Okay. Right, because that's the final kingdom, Rome, which is also Babylon, because Rome has inherited, the Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece, it's inherited the attributes of Rome. And it's and we've shown that it's 
it's done so through this symbol of 666, which comes from Babylon, which connects Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, right, which are sister chapters, both dealing with the blessings and curses. So, so all of this background information, all of this minutia has been totally disregarded as if he's completely unaware of it, which, which I think he probably is. I'm not going to say one way or the other. Because in in this, I know that he would listen fairly intently to a lot of points that Elder Jeff had made. But I know that at the time of the issues in Newport, he'd been on a job in Alaska. Mm -hmm. When that was done, when he came back here, there were other issues that he focused on. But I cannot say what he knows and what he doesn't know. Yeah. So now you say listening intently. So there is scientific studies that have shown that people can think that listening to things, watching videos, even even reading papers, is that they that they're receiving knowledge and understanding. Right. Okay. But the fact is that people actually don't learn that way. Right. You can't just listen to something and learn. You actually have to apply it. You have to think about it. You have to formulate your ideas. You have to understand a lot of information. Like understanding things is hard. It's, there's a lot of work involved in learning a skill. And, and, and I guess it's my contention that, that I find that people generally are intellectually lazy. That is, they don't really take much time to study. They don't grapple with the ideas. They don't try to work them out. Now, writing a paper, you would think that he would have have done this, right? Because writing a paper is, is in a sense, applying something. You put it down on paper and you start to see, does this make sense or not? Can I present these ideas to others? Can other people understand them? That's where I was going to say that, you know, we can... We can get a lot of knowledge, add to our knowledge, understanding. That's what you're saying, basically. Mm-hmm. We can get all the knowledge we want, but if we don't really understand it, then it's just book knowledge, no practic- practical skill. Yeah. Well, one of the things I found um, that in my experience with people, and I found this, you know, because you mentioned, you know, he's following Jeff Pippinger. Um, Elder Jeff and, and listening intently. And I found that there was lots of people in the movement that, uh, for one, they didn't understand what Jeff was talking about. That, that is, they couldn't present what he presented. They didn't, they didn't have a concept of the lines and how they worked and operated. And, and, uh, at one point, you know, and I've told the story before, I was at the camp meeting in uh, 2016 and there was you know some guys there and they were they were talking about the lines and I said I don't understand the lines and and they mocked me right for not understanding the lines and what I meant is because I actually understood them really well but I didn't understand what was being presented it seemed like that that what was being presented seemed to be completely contradictory to what we had understood about the lines Right now, it turns out these people had no understanding of the lines. <laughs> right, but but they they were mocking me for not understanding, and and I was able to sort of evaluate when Parminder came in with his deceptions. I was I was able to really easily evaluate what was wrong with his presentation, what he was, what had been happening to destroy the lines, and and particularly he brought out this point that each of the way marks in uh, are not um, typical of each other, each way mark. That is, in a way mark, when you zoom in, you have another reform line. And and he was rejecting that idea, which was really the foundation of the lines in the first place. Like that was the whole idea about the lines. And so that when you applied that to what he was doing, you could see that his lines were nonsense. They were they were a a um, a sleight of hand to get 
him into the position that he wanted to take over the movement. So, so it was just kind of rather interesting how we, we don't understand things and, and we need to understand things. Everything has to make sense. You can't just believe a bunch of things that are contradictory. Um, you know, when it came, when it came to understanding uh, the state of the dead, for instance, you know, you know, we understand that when you die, you're dead until the resurrection. It's clearly taught in the Bible. But I would find that most Christians have contradictory beliefs about what happens when you die. Because there are Christians who believe that when you die, you go to heaven. But they also believe in the resurrection, right? Which which makes no sense. Right. Right? But, but you know, it's like people don't put their ideas together. They hold one set of ideas and another set of ideas that contradict each other, but they don't they don't put it together. And and it's I guess it's easy sort of there's lots of things that we have like that you know especially when we're children and we're growing up we believe lots of different things that don't really make sense but as mature christians we need to have an intelligent belief system and it needs to be consistent so you know we have to think about that as we study anyway go on dwight so this paragraph is a little it's very different from what our understanding has been especially when we're applying properly this portion from five testimonies. Yeah. Because as we're looking at this, we have Protestantism, spiritualism, and Rome joining hands. Yeah, papal Rome. Yeah. Now, the rest of this, that this is an interesting point, considering that one half of our government is democratic and the other half is republican, sets aside the understanding of the two horns because mm-hmm. our understanding of the of those two horns is protestant and republicanism which has nothing to do with the republican party right it's a form of government that the united states has right constitutional republic. because a constitutional republic is not a democracy. And that's a, a point that many fail to understand. Yeah, it, it has democratic aspects to it, people vote, but that's actually not a democracy. Okay. That's the way the United States is set up. It's set up as a Republican, constitutional republic. But anyway. At this point, Salome does not make any request, but instead goes back to her mother for instruction. The point to make as it relates to Daniel 11 is that the mother is the one who is in charge and the daughter is subordinate. Again, this is why the papacy remains as the principal subject from verse 31 on through verse 45. Now, this is an offhand agreement to Rome establishes the vision, but it doesn't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just from verse 31 through 45. Rome establishes the vision throughout when we are looking at this within Daniel 11. Right. The whole point has to do with Rome, both in its pagan and papal phases. But and, and that is the pagan part becomes typical of the papal part. And, you know, it becomes divided in the pagan part when it's divided under Constantine. And those divisions uh, uh, symbolize what happens with Babylon at the end or the paper or the world at the end being divided into three parts. But yeah, but he doesn't seem to understand, of course, you know, what we've studied about Daniel 11 is that this is about uh, the prophetic mirror. It's about the whole uh, Leviticus 26 and the Kazone vision and how that all relates, how that ties everything together. So he's he's addressed it to some degree with the two twelve sixties, even though he has the wrong date starting the first one, but um, but he doesn't really put it together. He doesn't realize what he's dealing with. Salome was unconscious of the purpose of her mother. She did not know that her dance would result in the martyrdom of John, nor did she realize that she was herself being deployed as a tool for the purpose of securing the king's favor. Salome had nothing of her own to offer in the way of intelligent negotiations. 
but it was her young, beautiful body, which her aging mother no longer possessed, that achieved the desired result. Now, here, a misquote is given because there's no reference provided. Herod waited in vain to be released from his oath. Then he reluctantly commanded the execution of the prophet. The point that he wishes us to accept without proof. This represents the testing of the U.S. Constitution and then its repudiation. Now, he wishes to continue with the following. Marvelous in her shrewdness and cunning is the Roman church. She can read what is to be. She bides her time seeing that the Protestant churches are paying her homage in their acceptance of the false Sabbath and that they are preparing to enforce it by the very means which she herself employed in bygone days. Those who reject the light of truth will yet seek the aid of this self styled infallible power to exalt an institution that originated with her. How readily she will come to the help of Protestants in this work, it is not difficult to conjecture. Who understands better than the papal leaders how to deal with those who are disobedient to the church? Now, now Glenn immediately wants to quote 5T451, which when we read it, we can see that this is Protestantism grasping the hand of spiritualism. They are two separate, independent powers mm-hmm. grasping the hand with the papacy, with Rome. Yeah. It is not that Protestantism has become spiritualism. They are individual powers. Mm-hmm. Is that is that clearly presented by what Mrs. White wrote here in Five Testimonies? Yes. Now it's it's interesting that the context in Five Testimonies, because um, she's going to make a similar quote, but in reverse order in the Great Controversy. Okay. And she's going to have uh, spirit uh, Protestants stretch his hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. And then reach over the abyss to grasp, clasp hands with the Roman power, right? So she's going to switch spiritualism and uh, Roman power in the great controversy. But here in 5T, she does it this way. And the reason, because the context in the great controversy is she's dealing with spiritualism and uh, the doctrine of you know, the false doctrine of, of hell and, and the immortal soul and all that stuff, right? Right. And here in 5T, she's dealing with the Sunday, right? So these two great errors, uh, Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. And so when she presents them in these two different contexts, she actually switches the order, but she still keeps a gulf and abyss in the same order. She just switches Roman power and spiritualism. And, and I always try to figure out what, you know, why does she do that? Um, but one thing is it clearly shows that they aren't like you can't have Protestantism also be spiritualism. Right. Right. That what happens is Protestant America, because that's what Protestantism represents. Right. It, it's it's um, it's grasping hands with with these powers bringing about uh this in this case it's going to be talking about the sunday law right in the one in the great controversy let me see and just whoops um so great controversy 588 <clears throat> so she's going to be talking about uh, uh through the two great errors the immortality of the soul and sunday sacredness satan will bring the people under his deceptions while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, right? So you can see that that's switched around. And they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. Right. Okay. And under the influence of this threefold union, 
right, which is the same there. This country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of conscience. So it's a little bit different quote, but you can see that it, it makes it really clear that these are three distinct powers that unite at the end of the world, that you can't have spiritualism being also the Protestants. Right. So the, his quote, the quote doesn't support what he has said. In any manner. Yeah. Neither of the quotes are supporting what he's saying. Yeah. They're both in direct opposition to it. Mm -hmm. Now, it is the same strategy and for the same reasons that the papacy will use apostate Protestantism to gain her objective. As Salome did not realize the depth of hatred that her mother had for John, so the same is true for Protestantism. She does not understand the hatred that her mother, the papacy, has for those who expose her system, which results in their martyrdom. Now, what was it about this situation that caused Herodias to be so angry with John the Baptist? Yeah, and, and see, we're forgetting about John the Baptist here as a symbol. Right. Because that, that represents God's people. Correct. Okay. Um, so John is exposing uh, the illicit marriage of Herodias and Herod. Correct? So, is that correct. He's exposing the illicit marriage. He is exposing a marriage that is not according to God's order. Mm -hmm. And that's the religious and civil power. Correct. That's why Herod represents the civil power, which is the world, right? The, the governments of the world, the UN. So how many times do we choose when we want something, as Herod obviously wanted in his brother's wife, Herodias? How often do we then choose to follow the wrong path and set aside the word of God? This is the problem that was occurring here. Mm -hmm. Herodias didn't want to have to give up the power and the prestige that she gained by being married to this Herod. She didn't want Herod to see his guilt for what it was. So, as you were saying earlier, here is a, here is a sin that they wanted to have in a manner of speaking, swept under the rug and not to be addressed. But John, being the faithful prophet, being the prophet that spoke plainly and directly, had said that this was not a marriage in God's order. Conclusion, this last persecuting power is by far the most formidable and Satan has deployed this last and most powerful weapon against a nation and a church that is ill-prepared to meet it. The special work of this power is to remove the ability to discern the true work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it leads someone to think that something is of God when it is really from Satan, or that something is of Satan when it is, re is really from God. And therein lies the real issue as to why the prophecy of Daniel 11 is misinterpreted by the highest levels of Adventism. It began with the substitution of the new view of the daily in place of the old. The new view portrays the daily as Christ's ministry. The old view portrays the daily as Satan's ministry. Is it of God or is it of Satan? The reason for this substitution stems from our adoption of the interpretive principles of this third persecuting power, that of apostate Protestantism. Now, does Mrs. White ever in any manner show apostate Protestantism as a persecuting power of its own? No. I agree. It doesn't. Now, this idea that there's this third persecuting power doesn't make any sense. Just as the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, so Daniel 11 is a revelation of Satan. Now, this well, that's, 
So one is we we what is it that in Daniel chapter ten? What is the name of the vision that he has that is going to be Daniel chapter eleven and twelve? Because we have different words for vision. We have kazon, we have mara, we have mara. Isn't it the mara? It's the mara, the looking glass vision, right? Okay. So it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. He has, actually has a parallel vision to John's revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1. To, to say that Daniel 11 is a revelation of Satan. That's stepping it, on some very. Is, is, is more than wrong. It's blasphemy. Yeah, it well, it's it's completely understanding what the revelation of Jesus Christ is, um, and 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 yeah, it's definitely not a revelation of Satan. Now, it's true that Satan's character is always exposed when we have a revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Right. Because that's true in the Book of Revelation as well. So, if we are going to and we've used this illustration lots, but if you're going to know uh, what a counterfeit is, you need to know what the genuine is. Correct. So so we need a revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't need a revelation of Satan. We need, we need to see Christ because that light shines in the darkness and reveals to us our sins. And, and that character of Satan, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Satan is Satan, but we ourselves are satanic because of believing his lies. It, we have been controlled by Satan. And so we need this light of the gospel to shine into our hearts, to reveal to us the sin in our in our ourselves. We don't need a revelation of Satan. I mean it's just it's just crazy. I, I this to me is the worst thing that he has said so far in all of these articles. And, and it doesn't follow logically from anything that really he has said. Now, I, I understand, like, you know, because he's going to deal with this daily, and, and in a sense, he's going to do, he's playing around with things. Because, so he says, here lies the real issue, why the prophecy of Daniel 11 is misinterpreted by the highest levels of Adventism. So he has started this before where he talks about the false view of the daily, where we put the the, the Christ as the daily, but the daily is paganism, right? So we put the new view of the daily that it's Christ's heavenly ministry. That's wrong because the daily is paganism. It's it's a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary, not a counterfeit of the heavenly, right? Now, abomination of desolation is a counterfeit of the heavenly. So 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 he, he does this play. So he says this new view portrays the daily as Christ's ministry. The old view portrays the daily as Satan's ministry. Is it of God or is it that of Satan? So he's done a bait and switch here. He hasn't really, he hasn't really proved any of this, but he's playing with us, mm -hmm. right? And then he says the reason for this substitution stems from our adoption of the interpretive principles of this third persecuting power, that of apostate Protestantism, which would resonate with lots of people who would say, yeah, we, you know, we can't use. Uh, this this interpretation but he has not used the correct interpretation of scripture he has not followed miller's rules he has actually adopted a principle uh, principles of interpretation that more closely align with apostate protestantism than anything in adventism he just doesn't know it and so so this to me this this type of thing if he knows what he's doing and I'm not sure that he knows what he's doing, but if he knows what he's doing, he's extremely clever in how he's presenting this to manipulate people who are acquainted with this movement to accept his views and ideas. It, it's very clever. And but I don't think he's actually knows that he's doing this because I don't think this comes from him at all. No. Right. I don't I, I think his mind is being worked by some other power, just as the minds of our leaders were worked by some other power when it came to the new view of the daily. Right. Correct. 
So this to me is is very, very telling that there's something spiritually wrong with Glenn, not that I can judge another human heart, because I'd rather talk to him personally about it. But but the absurdity of of what he's just saying, um, he he doesn't even seem to to realize what he's doing, right? That's I'm pretty sure he has no idea what he's just done. Well, we cannot set aside Daniel 10 and 12 from Daniel 11 because all three are one prophecy. And they're also connected to Revelation. Right? Exactly. And, 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 that Satan, one that and how can how can Daniel be a revelation of Satan when we have Palmoni, the wonderful number who is Jesus Christ, revealed in Daniel. It's a revelation of Christ, the book of Daniel. And his yeah. prophecy is a certain revelation and a more certain word of revelation of God. Yeah, it doesn't add up. Yeah, Satan's not, Satan is unmasked in, in the book of Revelation, just as he is unmasked in the book of Daniel. Right? But that doesn't make any of them a, a revelation of Satan. They're unmasked. Per, perhaps... Perhaps are, that's what he intends to say, is it's an unmasking of Satan, for sure. But, but he's not saying that. He's he's contrasting Revelation and Daniel 11 as one being right, a revelation yeah. of Christ and one being a revelation of Satan. And both, both yeah. unmask Satan by revealing Christ. The only way that we can really know our sin is to see and know Christ. We need to know Christ. We need to know of his character. We, we need, need to the Marah. We, yeah, we need the Marah vision, which is the vision of Daniel chapter 10. That, that's introduced in Daniel chapter 10, the looking glass vision. We know that, that the symbols of that, it has to do with the prophetic mirror and also has to do with the law, the perfect law of liberty that's a mirror, right? Both in James and uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, both talk about the law as a mirror and that we have to look into this law of liberty, right? And because Christ's character is revealed, the law re reveals Christ's character. So there's all of these, these really important um, concepts and principles of scripture that he is just completely ignoring, that you would never draw this conclusion and contrast Revelation and Daniel 11 in this way. The the issue that I'm seeing from what from what we have been reading and from my conversations with him, there is a lot of influence here from Uriah Smith. And being blunt, while I'm not going to debate the God's helping hand comment, Right. We know that, that the thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Ryan Smith are, are useful books. Okay. Yeah. I'm also very aware that Mrs. White was very extremely clear that angels of the adversary controlled every member of the Smith household. Yeah, including Uriah Smith himself. Exactly. Now, I'm also seeing quite a few elements in here of Leroy Froome, who I know that Glenn believes was a, an amazing historian and a great author. Really? I, he believes that Froome was not, yeah. not a liar, that he was actually a great historian and great author? Correct. Okay. Glenn? Yes. So it, Leroy Froome is uh, definitely not any of those. A, a right. smart guy. But uh, uh, very deceptive in how he presents history. In the past, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, Froome is a historical revisionist. Yeah. Yes, he laid the ground. He laid the groundwork for George R. Knight. The issue that that I have in reference to Froome is first, he was the one that that introduced and convinced leadership to accept. The concept of the Trinity. Yeah. Second, because Froome was one of the three men, Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, 
and read that were the Frida of questions on doctrine, when they started to set aside the prophetic waymarks of the pioneers, I found I had no use for any of them. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> what Glenn had stated in this particular paragraph, just as the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, so Daniel 11 is a revelation of Satan. I have to disagree with him. Mm -hmm. This prophecy reveals the true character of Satan himself. Well, if Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are a single prophecy, then how can the Mara, the looking glass vision, be a revelation of the character of Satan? It is a revelation where we have to compare ourselves with Christ. Mm -hmm. It also shows that there are two entities that stand directly in his way using english grammar he's saying that there are two entities that stand directly in the way of satan of obtaining yeah. complete world dominion he is very how, how to uh, how to say this he uses the english grammar in the earlier part of these last two presentations and twists it yeah so it shows that there are two entities that stand directly in Satan's way of obtaining complete world dominion, and it lays open Satan's operating strategy to neutralize and destroy both. Now, now he probably does mean the papacy, though, right? Not Satan? I'm, I'm using... I'm not... <laughs> yeah, I know. You're using the rules that he has, he has set down. Correct. Yeah. But but he he does mean the papacy. He's just not thinking. Correct. Yeah. Now here he says these two entities are the United States of America and the Seventh Day Adventist Church. They are represented respectively as the King of the South and the King of the North of Daniel eleven forty. Using the rules that he has laid down, he is saying that the United States is the King of the South. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the king of the north. This flies directly on everything that we have been seeing, that we have been addressing, and that biblically we have found. Mm -hmm. The one deals with the civil, the other deals with the moral. The first sets up sets forth the principles of republicanism and protestantism and the second sets forth the sabbath and the non-immortality of the soul these two kings strike directly at the dual nature of the papacy manifested in its corrupted civil and religious principles it is these two assaults that provoke the papal counterstrike. now again in using 5t451 protestantism links hands with spiritualism and the two together are linking hands with the papacy with rome well uh, well i would think that actually it doesn't say the two together it says that the united states links hands with spiritualism and it links hands with the papacy but it doesn't say the papacy and spiritual spiritualism link hands with each other though it okay. is a threefold union okay but but it's threefold because of the United States. The United States is the connecting link that makes it threefold. So instead of, you know, three people standing in a circle, sort of holding hands in a triangle, I guess, it would be, you know, the United States standing between the papacy and spiritualism. The United States is holding hands with both. I don't see that the papacy is holding hands with spiritualism in that direct way okay but but that's just my vision of it my my perspective of what she says and how i understand it, it prophetically but another thing to point out here is that he is presenting new light right and we have some specific examples throughout scripture and this bible and this the bible and the spirit of prophecy on how new light works right so new light is old light that is seen more clearly. 
right? That is new light never rejects old light. That is, there is something that leads us along a path. God's word, word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. The path of the just as is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day, right? So as we progress in our understanding of scripture in our Christian walk, we are obedient to the light that's at our feet and we continue to walk in that light and God gives us further light down the path. And some of that light we would call new light. But none of the new light can reject the old light. The light that got you there can't be rejected. Right? Correct. New light doesn't reject old light. It can't possibly because the old light got you to where you are. And and those that reject uh, the new light never understood the old, Ellen White says. Right? So when new light comes along and I say, well, that's not new light but it actually is making our old light shine brighter, then that person never understood the old light. And we can see that with an understanding of the 2520 and and how this is old light from Adventism that has been rejected. And so when people reject the 2520, they don't realize that they're rejecting old light and that this new light isn't really new. It's just an understanding of old light that had been rejected, right? So... But he is he is now rejecting the whole basis of this movement, right? Right. right. Just like the Seventh Day Adventist Church rejects the twenty three hundred days and the seventy weeks, and or many people in the church do, as historical facts. They they just believe them as some kind of symbols. You know, they didn't really literally have to happen. Or the Christians who believe, you know, well Jesus didn't really have to exist and the resurrection didn't really have to happen, right? Like my dad. So, but we can see here that there's no way that he is where he is without all of this light that has come from this movement, and yet he has rejected it, the very foundation of this movement, just as Adventists reject the foundation of Adventism. You just can't do that. It's intellectual suicide. It's... And, and when you do this, you're pulling out a thread of a sweater, you know, when sweaters were knitted, uh, you know, one thread. And you unravel the whole thing. You just end up with a pile of wool at your feet. Now, now to question what you just said, is this intellectual suicide or is this intellectual and spiritual suicide? Yeah, well, it's both. Okay. Yeah. Now, just as the papacy uses Protestantism slash spiritualism to accomplish her design in the civil government of the USA, so she uses Protestantism, spiritualism to accomplish her end in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Both of these counterattacks are achieved through the medium of education. Now, he's brought up this education thing before, and, and obviously we know that there's true education that falls. But again, these are just these little things that he throws in. They're sort of... Um, We'll call them treats, you know, like in training a, a dog to respond or train it, a cat or something. Right. It, they, they appeal to certain people, but they're not logically part of any argument that he's making. Now, one of the other books that that he has had, and I'm I'm trying to recall the author. The title begins with Broken Cisterns. Living um, Fountains of Broken Cisterns. And that's sure. by Frizee, isn't it by Frizee? Or is no. that by someone? Else? It's not Frizee, it's, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I can find it. It's, it's by E.A. Sutherland. Sutherland, right, that's who it is, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I knew it was one of the pioneers there in uh, Frizee's later, but um, yeah, Sutherland, living, yeah. So he's, I, so. he's attempting here to give credence to Sutherland, but he's doing so through the lens of Smith and Froome. Mm -hmm. His next quotation, 5T294, the enemy is preparing for his last campaign against the church. He has so concealed himself from view that many can hardly believe that he exists, much less can they be convinced of his amazing activity and power. They have, to a great extent, forgotten his past record. And when he makes another advance move, they will not recognize him as their enemy, that old serpent. 
but they will consider him a friend who is doing good work. Now he says, the identity of the kings of the south and the north of Daniel 1140 are without a doubt the most de debated topic of the entire prophecy. In the following articles, plural, we are going to take a closer look at these two kings, the United States of America and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to make the case, so to speak, using the terms of our proposal. Well, Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a king. No. So but it's also no way that we can have these two be the king of the north and the king of the south. No. It absolutely need to not. Be there in 1798. Yeah, I mean, he just the whole basis of so many different ideas. You know, he he he's cutting all these wires <laughs> that are suspending uh, suspending him. You know, all of these things that are the basis of where he is, where he's at, as far as you know, understanding certain things. And yet the, the very basis of those things is being undermined, right? He's undermining the whole foundation of his message. We'll just, just leave it at that uh, by, by doing this. It, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, I have different sort of emotions about it. Obviously, I find it very disappointing and disturbing. You know, and I worry about him. And I don't know him personally, but, you know, when I, when I read things that people write, I still care about that person on some level, right? You know, but, but then, you know, I'm also just so intrigued, like how people think, you know, the, the thinking process that's going into this. Um, it just to me is amazing. You know, I wish I could understand it fully, how, how somebody comes, because here he's talking about, he quotes from Ellen White about Satan and how he works and doesn't realize he's, totally caught by Satan and how he works. He has almost forgotten. He has, to a great extent, forgotten his past record. Right. When he makes his another advanced move, they will not recognize him as their enemy. This is exactly what has happened to Glenn. He, he should know, right? He's, he's giving this quote, and he should know how Satan operates and works, and he should be able to see it, but he can't. Now, now, Kelly phoned me yesterday, and he was telling me about a person that he met who was um, some kind of, I guess, an evangelical or something, really caught up in in a lot of the same thinking as uh, the Canadian group in their conspiracy theories, and you know, I guess the American group as well. And, you know, what we see there is, you know, an attachment to sensationalism, right, and a disregard of the gospel and how we are to act as Christians, right? So it's a, a justification of self. So religion is used as a way of avoiding who you are, right? That's how we look at it. Avoiding your defects of character. So your focus is always on, you know, the evil that's out there in the world, you know, how evil, you know, the governments are, how evil, you know, the media is, how evil uh, the church is, how evil the papacy is. And if you're Seventh-day Adventist, you know, how evil the Seventh-day Adventist church is, or if you're, you know, in a movement, how evil different groups or people are. The focus is never upon ourselves to recognize our own sins. The gospel is to reveal to us Christ so that we can see our defects in character. Amen. And, you know, and again, I don't know Glenn personally, but I would say that, you know, it seems to me that he's very similar to many people that I have met. They have some idea that they want to push. They're not straightforward in how they do it. That is, and, and they're personally attached to the idea. And, and it becomes a, a matter of, of, of separating them from others, right? And, and the reason that we study the truth is not to make ourselves appear better than others, but we want to reach people, right? And we can use religion in a way that, you know, people are often right, you know, oh, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us. And, and the reason why they, they do that is sometimes that's actually what we are. <laughs> 
you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we don't represent Christ. You know, we don't represent his meek, meekness and lowliness. And all of us are in that that boat. You know, none of us can say, yeah, I've always represented Christ. I've always been Christ-like in how I've dealt with others. I haven't been proud or, or self-seeking in, in any way because we all have been. And, and we all, it's all a part of our nature. So, you know, in, in studying this, we're not studying this to tear down Glenn. We, we would want to help him. But we also want to examine ourselves, as I keep bringing up. And, and, and so we have to say, are we going down this same path that he is? We have to be very careful that we're not. Agreed. Do we have any other comments, thoughts, or questions today? Brothers and sisters, I want to thank you each for assisting in assessing all of these articles. There's quite a bit that I've had to consider. I mean, as I've read these, I have become heart sick. There is a lot that we have found that we need in order so that as we go through the three steps of the sanctuary, as we go through the three visions, the calzone, the marae, the mara, that we learn more and more about our great need, not just for justification, sanctification, and our preparation for judgment, but of our great need of Christ. May the Lord help us all. Shall we now close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, help us. We do not understand as we should our great need of you. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our attitude. Forgive us of our pride and our arrogance. Help us to come together unified and direct so that the message that you want to be given is given so that we are not giving our opinions, that we are giving a message that you desire. Be with us through this day. Help us in all ways, so that what is done may be according to your will. For this we thank you. For this we praise you always in Jesus' name. Amen.